One of the things we like to do in our classrooms is make connections with other disciplines. And there's such an overlap. When we talk about atomic history and atomic structure, there's such an overlap uh, with physics because of the nature of the atom that we really want to impress on our kids the idea of electrons moving in waves and moving like light. And a lot of times we kind of gloss over that. We teach them about the structure with protons, neutrons, and electrons, but very rarely, seldom, will we go into the actual nature of the movement of the, of the particles. So what we're going to look at now is a little bit of physics and how it's involved in the electromagnetic spectrum as we talk about it in terms of light. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to call up a couple of volunteers and have them help me with a demonstration that's going to show the difference between the colors of light that we have here. What I did is I went to the um, electronic store and purchased a blue LED light and a red LED light. Um, and they're very nice for this demonstration to show the difference in energies uh, between these two items. So at this point in time, if we could have our two volunteers come up. What I have wrapped up in aluminum foil here is a glass bottle with phosphorescing zinc sulfide in the bottom. Now that's a solid. I have it in the bottom, but I've got a water solution over the top of it. It's not going to dissolve. The water's going to be there to disperse the particles uh, when we start to see the reaction take place. Um, and, and we'll see that momentarily. Okay, so we have Polly and Mary, and we're going to give Polly this vial, and we're going to give her the blue LED, and we'll give Mary the other bottle with the red LED. And what we're going to do is we're going to have them unwrap the foil, and they're going to shine the LEDs underneath the glass bottle for about 20 to 30 seconds. And we're going to try to see if we can make some observations from that. Now what we want to do is normally if I was working in my classroom, I would pick two students and have them really darken the room, have them go to opposite sides of the room um, so that the light interferes. For the visual purposes of this, we're going to take a black sheet of paper, put it between the two vials, so then we can make sure that we really have no light contamination in the other vial, or, or we'll hope to and we'll see how that works out. So at this point in time, we're going to put the lights down, <coughs> excuse me, and we will take and unwrap our vials. And when I start to count, I'm going to turn our lights on. And we're going to give about a 20 second count there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty one, twenty two, twenty three, twenty four, twenty five. And now we really want to shake those up as vigorously as we possibly can and set them towards the middle of the table. And we can see the difference in those two vials. Turn our lights off if we could, please. So what we did is we excited the electrons in there, and now they're falling back to their ground state. OK, thank you, ladies. Now we noticed that the zinc sulfide phosphoresced when blue light was shined through it. But the zinc sulfide didn't phosphoresce when the red light was shined through it. Well, let's take a little look into investigation as to why that happens. And one more demo to illustrate that. And if we could have the lights down at this point in time also, please. And we can see that. In this instance, I have a piece of. vinyl paper that you can purchase from Flynn. And if I draw on that with my red light, and this is also coated with a phosphorescing coating, but if I draw on it with my blue light, I can excite the electrons on there because the blue light has enough energy that we can write and we can excite those electrons as well. They jump out to higher energy levels. As they fall back, they give off photons of light as they return to the ground state. And the lights can come up, if we could, please. 
I like to use that at Halloween. I'll go get a skull mask and put it on there and you can shine a light over the top of that and make a skull appear on that. Use it any way you want to um, for entertainment purposes, educational purposes in your classroom. Okay, well why does the blue light make it phosphoresce and why does the red light does not? To illustrate that, we're gonna have another set of volunteers come up and we're gonna use a spring to talk about wavelength, frequency, and amplitude and how it relates to the red and blue light. So if we could have our volunteers come up to the front, please. And you want to get one of your own springs because the physicists do not like it when you come down and you spring their spring. So make sure you have one of these for this demo. And in my classroom, we'll just stretch this out all the way across. And put your both hands behind it if you would, please. There you go. In my classroom, I've always tried to shake the spring and get a standing wave. And I'm always trying that, and it gets all messed up, and the kids kind of see it and kind of don't. And so I think we're doing the kids a disservice by not having them see a standing wave. So we're going to freeze it in time and space. And so I think I'm going to come and stand out there and try to direct these ladies. And I always have a contest between the boys and the girls. And I always call the boys up first because I want them to mess up, because then the girls laugh at them. And it's always easier to see from out there than it is standing here. So the first wave we're going to make is we are going to have a high frequency wave with low amplitude. And I'd see if they can get this to go. A high frequency wave with low amplitude. All right, so your, right hand, your left hand is up and your right hand is down. And we can see that if we count the waves. And I will have kids count wavelengths We'll talk about frequency. And we can see that there's a number of waves here. We can measure distance. Kids can lock into that with their brains. And that's a great visual when they go back to recreate that when they're thinking about how the electrons move. In our second wave then, I would bring a second group up. In this case, we're just going to use this group. Now I would like you to make a wave that has high amplitude, long wavelength, and low frequency. High amplitude, low wavelength, long wavelength, I'm sorry, and low frequency. So we can see now we've basically created one large wavelength, and we can talk to the kids, okay, count them now, how are wavelength and frequency related? Okay, so I'll pick up the spring from here. I appreciate it, thank you very much. And you can help me so that we don't spring it. Help me with that, if you would, Penny, please. And we'll put it right back on that. As we were making those observations, I would ask the students, okay, what's the relationship between wavelength and frequency? When I had a lot of waves, my frequency was way up, but the wavelength was way down. And you have them do these, these motions in class. Have them do that, they'll remember. When the frequency went down, the wavelength went up. That's an inverse relationship. And they start to lock into this, and, and now we start to develop this idea of why the blue and red lights acted in different manners. Going over to the chalkboard, we show them the proportionalities. Wavelength is not proportional to frequency. Wavelength is proportional to the inverse of frequency. We have wavelength usually measured in nanometers. Frequency with nu is measured in hertz, seconds to the negative one. Well, how do we turn a proportionality into an equation? We need a constant. And the constant that's been developed and studied is the speed of light. And so wavelength times frequency is the speed of light. And so they're inverse by the factor of the speed of light. And so now we start to develop this idea that, yes, physics plays a role even in our chemistry laboratory. Okay. With that in mind, why then, coming back to the um, red and blue lights, why is it that the red and the blue lights act in different ways. I'm going to grab a meter stick, and now we have some audience participation in the classroom. And I, I try to hammer home the idea of frequency with students. What I would like to have is this side of the room, you're gonna be the A group. That side of the room, you're gonna be the B group, okay? And we're gonna try to sing. Okay, I won't make you sing, but we're gonna say your particular letter. And what I do is I will have this drawn on the board, sometimes I'll do three wavelengths, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk past this with the meter stick. I'm going to slide the meter stick across there. When I pass a crest, I want you to say your letter in a rather verbose manner, okay? We'll see if we can blend this, all right? 
And I want you to listen to the whole room as this activity happens. Are you ready? Can you handle that? What side of the room? You're what letter? And you guys are? Okay. So here we go. Are you ready? Okay. When I pass a crest, a crest being the top part of the wave. Ready? Set? Go. Now we could work on our harmony on that, right? But what is it that the students are hearing? They're hearing frequency. A's, just by yourself right now, okay? Okay. B's, just the crest now. Ready? Go. Okay. They're speaking more frequently. What was the one constant between these two waves? Now, I really, I, I can't pick this, my chalkboard up and throw it across the room. Really, these waves are moving through time and space. So we're illustrating that with the meter stick of these waves moving through time and space. The constant for the two waves is how fast I'm moving. And that's the constant that we get that's the speed of light. And to me, that is really hammers home with the students this idea that, yes, these may have different frequencies, they may have different wavelengths, but they're going to have about the, the, say, they're moving at the same speed, and therefore we can have different energies involved in those. Okay. I follow this up by taking a piece of diffraction grating, like such. And I'm going to shine this light of red and this light of blue. And the nice thing about this is I can stack these. And I'm going to shine them through this paper. And you tell me if you can see those dots that are on there of light. And we can have the lights down. And you tell me if you pick those up. And if you'll notice that, and I think we can make the observation, I'm sorry. I think we can make the observation that the blue dots are closer together in a particular distance than the red dots. Is that observable? Okay. What that means is the blue dots are happening more frequently than the red dots. Therefore, they must have a shorter wavelength, a higher frequency, and we'll relate it to energy in just a minute. Okay? So I'll turn off my lights. And what I would do is I would then come over and I would change this. Now my A's, you're going to be red, okay? Now my B's be blue. You're going to say the word blue, and I would follow up with this. Red group, blue group. You know what to do. Ready? When we pass a crest. Ready, set, go. Red, 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 red. Okay, and that just hammers that home with them. Oh, the blue light must have more frequency. And if the blue light has more frequency, it can really energize those electrons out to the outer energy levels. As they go out to the outer energy levels and fall back, they give off photons of light. One of the things I like to do in the classroom, and I've seen Jeff Bracken do it from Ohio, he's the first one I saw do it, is he will play a song, I'm so excited by the Pointer Sisters. And he will get photons, and the kids either throw blue or red photons, and if they hit him with the right one, he'll jump up on the desk. And as he comes back down, he'll throw out discs, and he'll say, photon, photon, as the music's playing. And that just hammers that home with kids, that as they're in the excited state on the desk, that's great. But as they fall back down to the ground state, they give off a photon of light. Well, when they give off a photon of light, that photon of light comes off with a certain frequency, Using Planck's constant, we can relate that frequency to the energy of light. As the frequency increases, if I multiply it by a constant, the energy has to increase. And that's why, coming back to the phosphorescing zinc sulfide, when that phosphoresces, it's the blue light that has enough energy to make it phosphoresce, as opposed to the red light, whose wavelength is too long, Frequency is too little, and its energy is too little. It just doesn't make it phosphoresce. 
Thank you.